The following special episode of Addressing Gettysburg is brought to you without commercial interruption by our Patreon page. Just go to patreon.com slash addressing Gettysburg so you can help support the show and keep it going and growing. We've got a lot of big ideas for the 160th and they need to start being produced now. So the more patrons we could get, the better. Just go to patreon.com slash addressing Gettysburg and help us help you. That's patreon.com slash addressing Gettysburg. And we thank you in advance. Now, on with the show. You're listening to Addressing Gettysburg. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to this episode of Addressing Gettysburg. Uh, You may recall last year, we did several episodes throughout the year about how they celebrated different holidays during the Civil War. Um, and that was Matt Borders who, uh, who did that with us, and he did a great job, such a great job. We said, Matt, what are we going to do next year? <laughs> you know, we did the holiday thing. What else can we do? And I thought, well, I don't remember whose idea it was, but uh, we came to the conclusion that doing the history of the Army of the Potomac would be a good place to start, and we're going to do four of these in the coming 12 months, let's say. Um, and we're going to uh, cover the history of the Army of Potomac each year. So 61, 62, 63, 64, and then 65 will be blended into 64 because there wasn't a lot of 65. Anyway, the point I'm trying to make is we're back and uh, with map orders, and uh, today we're starting that Army of the Potomac history uh, off with 1861, um, but we're going to go a little further back before we get to 1861. So welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to Matt Borders. Thank you, Matt, for coming on again. Matt, it's a pleasure to be here, as always. Thank you for having ba- me back to addressing Gettysburg. And I think it was uh, six questions, Lance there, who uh, suggested the, the history. Was it him? I think so. Oh, okay. Well, thank you, six questions, Lance. That was good. Okay. I don't remember that. I don't remember when he was, much. When he was sitting in on one of the episodes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, the, probably the last holiday one that you did? Yeah, I yeah. believe so. Okay. That I'm almost sense. positive it was his suggestion. I'm, I trust your memory than, better than <laughs> mine, so don't worry about that. All right. So, Army of the Potomac. Yes. And um, yeah. As you suggested, I did want to give it a little bit of context. Yes. So we're going to fall back a bit beyond the American Civil War and look at some of the things that are affecting these officers that are going to command the Army of the Potomac, some of the influences that they're going to have um, before the American Civil War. So let's get into that then. How far back are you taking us? Back Um, to 1776? (laughs) Well, we... (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> For doctrine and things like that, I suppose we could, but let's go back to the training ground, if you will, the Mexican-American War. All right, very so, good, yes. 1846. So we talk a lot about the size of the United States Army at the beginning of the Civil War, but for as small as it was at that point, of course it's even smaller in 1846 sure. at the beginning of the Mexican-American War. Um, that year there is 6,562 officers and men in the professional army. Okay. For the United States Army at the time. Wow. Yeah. That's surprisingly small. Yeah, staggeringly small. I thought you were going to say it was like 10,000. Yeah. No, less than 10,000. Uh, just over 6,500 men. Now, we're going to have a large... Now, wait a second. Is that 6,500 men in Mexico or 6,500 men in the entire service of the United States military? That's a great question Thank because you. that's the entire... A complement of the United States Army. So then, f- less than that is actually going to go to Mexico. Well, I here's can't the thing. imagine that they're letting making everybody go to Mexico. There's a huge volunteer push. Ah, okay. And so, with the volunteers, we're going to have about seventy three thousand five hundred men join up. Okay. And these will be with the various state forces, uh, the volunteer forces, very similar, honestly, to what we see for the American Civil War. And of course, we have a whole bunch of volunteers, just like our Civil War, coming from other countries as Mm. well. Hmm. So that's going to really balloon the federal troop strength up to about 78,718 men total. Okay. Okay. That sounds a bit more manageable. Right. (laughs) And we're still outnumbered by Mexico. Really? 82,000 men. Oh, okay. All right. Yep. Then they got the home court advantage, too. And they've got home court advantage. Huh. Now, the Mexican-American War, we generally say 1846 to 1848. The actual fighting is about a year and nine months. Okay. 71 engagements over the course of the war. Um, and that's going to be ended by the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo. Mm-hmm. Now, this 
series of engagements really is considered a training ground for the officers that would co- later command the various armies and have leadership roles in the various armies of both the North and South. The, the fighting here is interesting because of those 71 engagements, two of them are actually fought after the treaty is signed. Mm-hmm. Kind of a War of 1812 thing going on yeah, there. Yeah. Um, but the treaty is signed on February 2nd, 1848. And with that treaty, large, just massive swaths of land become U.S. territory. We're talking about uh, most of Colorado, Utah, Nevada, New Mexico, Arizona, California, and of course, Texas. Right. All of that land becomes U.S. territory. The only thing the United States has to do is they take on, they pay Mexico $15 million for that land and take on Mexico's debt that is owed to American citizens in Texas hmm. and things like that. So so we win it by winning a war mm-hmm. and, and then we, pay for it. Well, yes, because it's part of the negotiations of the peace treaty. And truth be told, we really do crush Mexico hmm. uh, in the Mexican-American War. We don't win every engagement, but it's damn close. Okay. And so that's why these the treaty terms are so weighted to the American side and just a huge half of the country practically. Sure. I mean, yeah, it was, it's a huge swath of land that they took. Exactly. And of course, with that huge swath of land, this is going to open all those territories below the 3630 parallel to slavery. Mm-hmm. This is going to allow, uh, obviously, Texas, one of the main reasons it decides to try to, uh, and does not just try, but it does leave Mexico, it breaks away from Mexico, is to continue having slavery in what becomes the the Texas Republic and later the state of Texas. So this is <clears throat> excuse me this is going to feed into those sectional problems that were already seen in the 1840s. Yeah, okay. And there were big fights in Congress about this. Um, about Polk basically having this war of manifest destiny that is just going to help the expansion of slavery. What do we do with all of this territory once we get it? So forth and so on. That's James K. Polk, the president of the United States that you're talking about there. Mm -hmm. Yep, exactly right. Now, due in large part to the overwhelming American victory in the Mexican-American War, the tactical doctrine of the time does not change significantly between the end of the Mexican-American War and the American Civil War. Okay. Okay. So General Winfield Scott, the hero of two wars now at this point, um, he wrote in 1835 the three-volume manual on infantry tactics and the rules of maneuver continued to be issued and used up until 1861. Now, William Hardy, Mm. he had written in 1855 the rifle and light infantry tactics built primarily off of French manuals, and those manuals would also be heavily used up to the American Civil War and even once the war begins. Interesting side note on the rifle and light infantry tactics, not only are they based heavily off the French manuals, the French manuals were actually translated and transcribed by a young Captain George Brinton McClellan. Ah, oh, okay. He did that in 1852. Now, 1861, as you know, William Hardy goes south, and he is going to publish the revised rifle and light inter- infantry tactics for the Confederate military. This is going to lead to the development of Silas Casey's Infantry and Drill Manual for the Union in 1862, which is based heavily off of Hardy. All of these manuals are based off of the previous one. Right. So now wait. So Hardy, when he goes south and does the revised version, how different is it? It's not. It's not. So what? So does he just write in a southern accent? <laughs> <laughs> like what is he like what is he uh, there is not a significant difference um i believe he has some of the pacing stepped up um, okay for marching and things like that and, and that is one of the few changes that we start to see in these manuals is things like the speed of the drill and the number of steps in the load in nine times right, knocking right. it down to say a load in four times and things like that okay okay um Silas Casey's infantry manual, again, based heavily off of Hardy, and it's being simplified. It's a simpler version of Hardy because of the necessity of having some sort of union manual to give to the, to the increasingly huge 
Union armies. Right. Okay. 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 Um, and just before anybody tries to catch me on it, there is, of course, another Confederate manual out there, Gillum, William Gillum's Manual of Instruction for Volunteers and Militia in the Confederate States. Okay. Great. It's, it's, it's so just, you it's, happy, super nerds? <laughs> it's another <laughs> one of these drill manuals that are being utilized. Okay. Um, what's interesting is, is that there is one form of drill, and I imagine you'll guess it, that is significantly different than the others uh, and is really the rage in the 1850s up into the early Civil War. I'm going to guess cavalry. Is that Think, right? Stay in infantry. Okay. Oh, oh in infantry. Yeah, okay. In infantry. Mm-hmm. Go ahead. Now, say it again then. So I was thinking, okay. as soon as you said... Go ahead. It's uh, it's all the rage across the United States. It's jumped upon from Europe, as so many of these do. All the rage across the United States in the late 1850s into the 1860s. It's going to be pushed by basically one militia instructor by the name of Elmer Ellsworth. God, man, I feel like I'm back in school. I was going to say Zouave. Exactly. Oh, okay. That's exactly oh, right. All right, great. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> Yay. <laughs> now, the, the Zouave manual is an adaption of Hardy, but it's sped up with the pace of the march and the drill and emphasized gymnastic drill and skirmishing. Mm. Um, hmm. What's interesting, though, is, is that even though it's the most recent European manual to jump the pond to the United States, it still does not emphasize long range or aimed fire, okay. which is really starting to catch on in Europe at this time. Okay. What is interesting, though, or I shouldn't say interesting, is that even though it's all the rage in the United States, it's also derided as a circus drill by those who don't like it. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't it funny how human beings, when something new comes along, that, that, is, that later proves to be better, right? But the resistance they have to it, like they can't see. Right. With the benefit of this new thing, and and I think we were talking before the show of uh, Culp's Hill, mm-hmm. and um, you know Green brigade commander he's like 62 years old or whatever and his division commander younger guy Mm -hmm. uh you know can't see he's just kind of rolling his eyes when green's like hey should we should uh you know dig in kind of fortify up here you know whatever we're not going to be here long and he's like well you know while we're here maybe we should just get that you know keep (laughs) the men just do this just do it it's fine whatever you want to do go ahead you know but he ends up being right right and it's like it it, it, it's like the young guy had the old way of thinking Mm mm-hmm and the old guy had the what would later be the newer way of thinking, you know, the way you know trenches and breastworks and the old you guy know, with the experience. The experience, right? And I don't recall off the top of my head um, the division commander Geary. Okay, yeah. So he's not inexperienced. Um, no, but Green's got a lot more. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I think he probably was just that annoying old guy who, sure. You know, like there's one in every crowd. There's like the annoying old guy who who has the experience and he does know better. He does know better. Mm -hmm. But the younger guy doesn't want to hear it. Right. Because the younger guy would rather the younger guy would rather come to the same conclusion as the older guy. But because he figured it out himself, Himself, not because the older guy told him this is how you do it. Mm -hmm. And that's the problem with youth. (laughs) I mean, it is the youths. (laughs) The youths. That's right. (laughs) So uh, what's interesting about this is that. Coming out of the war with Mexico are officers and men that would be that would influence the future Army of the Potomac, and we're talking about commanders of the Army of the Potomac: Erwin McDowell, George McClellan, Ambrose Burnside, Joseph Hooker, George Meade, and U.S. Grant. Now, obviously, Grant doesn't command the Army of the Potomac, but he rolls with it mm. late mm. Uh, in the war. And all of these guys are Mexican War veterans. All of these guys have had to deal with all of these manuals we were just talking about, and kind of a I keep saying interesting, I apologize, but an interesting side note is is that Grant would actually write extensively in his memoirs about his time in Mexico and referred to both the Mexican War and the Rebellion as unholy. Mm. That was the term he used. Mm. Now, that's 1848. We've still got some years before the Civil War breaks out. So the right. interwar years, there's actually two military campaigns I wanted to briefly touch on. Uh, and and many of your listeners are probably thinking bleeding Kansas. Sure. Yep, I'm, absolutely. I'm sure they are. I could, yep. I could sense them. <laughs> absolutely something that's tearing at, or helping to divide the country further. But we don't have a lot of the United States military involved. I was going to say, isn't Kansas. that more of like a guerrilla war? Type it is of a thing? guerrilla war. There is some presence of uh, federal troops in the territories of Kansas and Nebraska trying to 
run down some of these guerrillas, mm-hmm. but the bigger problems are actually due to policing actions against American Indians in the American Southwest at the time, okay. and also in Florida. Uh, I think I know where you're going with this one. Yep. So from 1855 to 1858, the United States will fight the third Seminole War in Florida. And it is important to emphasize it is the third Third, war. The native peoples of Florida had resisted the United States since 1817. That's before it's a U.S. territory. Tough cookies. Spanish. Very tough cookies. Um, Particularly the second Seminole War is particularly difficult for the United States military. Uh, And they are resisting the Indian Removal Act. And they would continue to do that through most of the 19th century. The third or last Seminole War saw only limited fighting, but tied up military resources for years. And future officers of the Army of the Potomac were heavily involved in both the second and third wars. We're talking 28 different generals yeah. that will serve in the Army of the Potomac. Give, give us some names. So go back to the Mexican War. So we all know uh, what we got. Uh, Grant. Yep. Uh, Longstreet. Uh, Lee. Lee. Jackson. Pickett. Bragg. Jackson. Bragg. Uh, who else? Uh, uh, McClellan, you mentioned. Yep. Hooker. Uh, was Hancock? No, he was younger, Too wasn't young. he? Yeah. Yep. Um, George Meade. Or Meade. McDowell. All right. And then how about the Seminoles? Give me some of those. Uh, let us let me pull out my list here. It's 28 different general officers, some guys that we would know. Give us the top five. Uh, let's see here. John Gibbon. I've heard of him. <laughs> William French. Uh-huh. Wee wee. Um, <laughs> uh, George Hartsuff. George McCall. Edward C. O. C. Uh, Ord. Ord, okay. Yep. Marcina Patrick. Oh, yeah. Yep. Provost uh, Marshall. Yep. Is, is it Provost or Provo? I say Provost, but I've yeah, heard I both. Too. I've heard both, but I like Provost better. Right. Go ahead. Alfred Pleasanton. Uh huh. Israel Richardson. Uh, Henry Slocum, George Sykes, Alfred Talbert. The names just keep going. A lot of them. Yeah. Yeah. A lot. Again, 28 right. different guys that are going to be generals in the Army of the Potomac. Um, Alexander Webb, Stephen Weed, just go, go, go. Um, the and what year? I'm sorry. What year was the was the Third Seminole War? 1855 to 58. 55 to 58. Okay. Yeah. And so. again, it's limited combat, but it's tying up these resources. And the Second and Third Seminole Wars are going to see all of these guys. And I'm going to imagine that they're learning something that they didn't learn those who were in the Mexican War that they didn't learn in the Mexican War because Indian fighting is a lot different than European fighting. Oh, absolutely. So they they had to have picked up something. And with the terrain that's in Florida and the swamps and everything else, the needing to rely on very narrow and very extended supply routes, the fact that the American Indians, the Seminoles, are attacking those supply routes and isolated positions and garrisons. Um, I've heard it described, and I don't know if all of your listeners would agree, but I think it's a somewhat apt description. It's 19th century Vietnam. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I, that's the way I always looked at uh, like any of the Indian Wars in the, well, ever. Mm. It's like Vietnam. Mm. It's same time, it's like, it's horrifying. It's like a horror movie. Mm-hmm. It's psychologically frightening as well as... And extremely stressful, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's a totally different uh, way to go. Now... On the opposite end of that spectrum, if you will, is a more formal military campaign that we don't hear a lot about, um, which is the 1857 to 58 Utah War Mm. or Utah Expedition. This is fascinating because it will be the largest movement of military infrastructure after the Mexican-American War prior to the American Civil War. Okay. We're going to have a column of 2,500 men with artillery moved from Fort Leavenworth, Kansas, to 50 miles beyond Salt Lake City, Utah. That's just over 1,000 miles. Okay. Okay. We don't see anything like that since the Mexican War and won't see it again until the Civil War. Um, Basically, what happens is that in 1857, there was concern that the Church of Latter-day Saints in the Utah Territory was growing too powerful and too independent. The territorial governor of Utah, Brigham Young had been appointed by Millard Fillmore in 1851. And by 1857, the new president of the United States, James Buchanan, wanted him removed and sent a new governor to the territory. Shortly thereafter, Buchanan is also going to send this military column to make sure his wishes are seen to. Um, Unfortunately, the change of territorial governors did not go through formal channels. Mm -hmm. And so Brigham Young is 
kind of perplexed by the situation. This guy showing up on his doorstep with a letter from the president saying, hey, I'm the new territorial government. It's time for you to GTFO. Um, <laughs> so he's actually going to tell his people, the Church of Latter-day Saints, to prepare for potential conflict. Mm. Uh, and of course, when he gets rumors of this column heading his way, he's definitely going to say, hey, it's it, it could be on here. So let's let's prepare. Um, the column itself is the 5th and 10th United States Infantry, Battery B of the 4th United States Artillery, we like them, mm-hmm. and uh, the 2nd U.S. Dragoons, all commanded by Colonel Albert Sidney Johnston. Okay. Yep. Um, the Utah War actually sees very little actual combat. Neither side ap- appears to want it to instigate a major war. Uh, you're going to see a lot of small-scale raids and skirmishes, and they're both leaning heavily on American Indian allies. Yeah. to do their fighting right. for them. Um, the largest loss of life was the uh, Mountain Meadow Massacre, um, which was unfortunately a civilian target. 120 people get butchered um, in September of 1857. Yeah, I think I've heard about that one. Probably. Is that like the most famous incident of the whole thing? Yeah, yeah. okay. Yep. Uh, by spring of 1858, Buchanan's appointee had been made, been made head of the Utah Territory after cooler heads had prevailed and they've kind of figured out what's going on. Um, and the expedition basically is a huge embarrassment to the Buchanan administration. It becomes known as Buchanan's blunder. And one reporter from the New York Herald wrote, thus was peace made, thus was ended the Mormon War, which may thus be historiarized, killed none, wounded none, fooled everyone. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. <laughs> but... These were the two major conflicts or two major campaigns between the American-Mexican War and the American Civil War. So let's move into 1861. All right. Let's do it. Um, In January of 1861, we've already hinted at this, Matt. Take Take a shot at how big the United States Army is. I'm going to say 16,000. Very good. Yep. Thank you. It's 16,367 officers and men, the vast majority of which are scattered across the nation, including 79 different posts west of the Mississippi River. Okay, so far. No railroad at this point. <laughs> right. At right. least not cross Not transcontinental, yeah. Right. Now, March 4th, 1861, Abraham Lincoln is made the 16th president of the United States, and he would proclaim in his first inaugural that the government intended to hold, occupy, and possess federal installations throughout the United States, including in the South. Of course, by this point, seven states have already ceded from the Union, and there is massive pressure on federal holdings throughout those seceded states. We see, of course, what's happening in Texas and Twig eventually um, basically turning over all facilities to the Texas government, Confederate government. We see what's going on, of course, in Charleston Harbor, uh, and that's been building since at least January. But Fort Pickens down there in Florida as well is under sea, sort of siege. So there's lots of things that need to be held, occupied, and possessed by the federal government. Now, two days after Lincoln's inauguration, Confederate President Jefferson Davis is going to call for 100,000 men to serve for 12 months. So now we have the Confederate states potentially preparing for war. And we would, with this call, we begin to see resignations within the United States Army to, quote, go south. Now, throughout the secession winter of 1860 and 61, we would eventually have approximately 300 officers of the thousand or so officers in the United States Army. So just about a third of the officers in the U.S. Army resign and go south. Here's a question that you might not be prepared to answer. Um, Why not just arrest those guys when they are resigning with the intention of going back to their state that is seceding or in rebellion, depending on your perspective, why not? Why wouldn't the federal government just be like, uh, okay, you're under arrest for conspiracy to commit treason or something like that? It's a good question, Matt. I think uh, your own research with the Civil War, we see how much more leeway officers get than yeah. enlisted men. Yeah. How many times have we seen an officer who just resigns and goes home during the war? Yeah. Because he's got 
something going on at home, or right. he's gotten sick and says, "Well, screw this, I don't want to do this anymore." Sure, uh, that sort of thing. Officers, but that's not treason. That's not treason. <laughs> but officers still have a lot more leeway, and I I suspect, though I do not know for certain, that the federal government, because they can't say and point at you, William Hardy, we know you're going to command Confederate forces in. The coastline, the Carolina mm. coastline, or mm. around Savannah, where he is at the at late in the war, uh, so you're going to be arrested because you're trying to resign. Or maybe they just didn't think that it would ever really. And there's get a that there's way. a lot like, of that, that far. too. Yeah, there's a lot of that, and I because we know the war is coming, right? But do they know exactly? I mean, there's talk of it, of course. There's definitely talk of it, but there's also this this real desire in the Buchanan administration to try to placate, and I think this might yeah. have something to do with uh, it. Ah, that's a good point too. It's not Lincoln. Well, exactly. And then once Lincoln um, is inaugurated, and he's obviously saying, "Okay, hold and occupy and possess," and then Jefferson Davis says, "Okay, well, it's time to build an army." That's when a lot of them do. Come. Right. Okay. So you could make the argument maybe at that point they could have tried to stop some of these guys, but it seems to be this deference towards officers and allowing them to, "You're an officer and a gentleman. You may do what you wish with your commission mm. and resign or what have you." Okay. Okay. Um, here's a fun fact, though, of the. United States Army, before the American Civil War breaks out, only 23 privates defect to the South. Really? Mm -hmm. Huh. There were only 25, though. In total. <laughs> in, the, in the whole army. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was all officers, no privates. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay, but that's interesting, though. Out of 16,000, only, what did you say, 23? About 15,000 troops, about 1,000 okay, officers. Okay, 15,000 then... troops, 23 of them mm. defect. Yep. And actually fight in the Southern... Now, how many of them... Um, go AWOL and go home or mm, go west mm. or something like that? Can't say. But we know of 23 in the old army that go south. Wow. Yeah. That's surprisingly low. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. But that's good. So just over a month after Lincoln's inauguration, uh, we have this period of intense waiting around Charleston Harbor. We're all aware of that. That's going to come to an end negotiations for supplying the garrison had failed and provisions were running out. In an attempt to avoid conflict, the Lincoln administration had informed Governor Francis Pickens of South Carolina on April 6th that a resupply effort was going to be made for Fort Sumter. Time had run out for Major Robert Anderson and his command there at Sumter, and on April 9th, Confederate President Jefferson Davis is going to order Brigadier General Pierre Gustave Touton Beauregard. <laughs> That's to, my favorite name to say. Absolutely. Yeah. You got to say it with a little oomph. Yeah, you it. do. Yeah. <laughs> he would order uh, Beauregard to strike a blow. Uh. Okay. So this will lead, of course, to the last minute negotiations on April 11th, and then on April 12th, 1861, at 320, 3.20 a.m., a pair of officers would be sent out to Fort Sumter. Sir, by the authority of Brigadier General Beauregard, commanding the provisional forces of the Confederate States, we have the honor to notify you that we will open the fire of his batteries on Fort Sumter in one hour from this time. Isn't and, it funny? We have the honor to notify you we're about to shoot you. Right. We have the honor to be very respectfully your obedient service of servants, James Chestnut Jr., aide-de-camp, and Stephen D. Lee. <laughs> Captain, C.S. Army, aide-de-camp. And, of course, they would begin firing at 4.30 a.m. 4.30, yeah. 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 And then, so that's interesting because Beauregard's there mm -hmm. at that time. But he's gonna, we're going to see him up north a little bit. Yes. Yep. Yeah, he's, uh, he's coming up north here shortly. Um, now, Washington is going to react to this in a big way. President Lincoln receives official word of the bombardment and subsequent su surrender. So when do, nice. So when do so, <laughs> surrender of Fort <laughs> Mowage. Sumter. Mowage. <laughs> Mowage. On April 14th. Well, things are here together. And <laughs> he's going to discuss uh, calling up 75,000 volunteers using the Militia Act, something he was allowed to do to put down the rebellion. Next day, April 15th. Lincoln announces this. Okay, He's calling up 75,000 volunteers as well as a special session of Congress to convene on the 4th of July of 1861. This was heralded in the North and condemned in the border states and the Upper South. Lincoln's call for volunteers was the last straw for Virginia, who up until this point had voted down multiple attempts to secede from the Union, but on April 17th, the Virginia Convention voted to leave the Union. Okay. And then they're going to turn it over to the state population that votes overwhelmingly to leave. 
Now, with no significant military presence in Washington, D.C., and Virginia just across the Potomac now arming for war, a number of volunteer militias were formed by the request of Brevet Lieutenant General Winfield Scott. The Frontier Guards under Kansas Senator James Lane was organized from 120 Kansas men who had come to the District of Columbia first as guards and later to get uh, patronage positions from the Lincoln administration. So they're all in town to get their government jobs and now they're being formed up as guards. Um, They were assigned to defend the president himself and camped in the East Room of the White House, interestingly enough. Hmm. Now, besides the Kansas men, there were also the Clay Battalion, named after Cassius Clay, known as Cash due to his wealth. Uh, Cash Clay was a cousin of Henry Clay and was in Washington in preparation for leaving for St. Petersburg, Russia. He was actually being sent by the administration to Russia. Right. Um, This is not by the, just in case people are confused still, it's not Muhammad Ali we're talking about. (laughs) I figured you were going to mention that. (laughs) Yeah. I just, I know there's somebody out there going, I didn't know he was that old. Right. (laughs) Now, instead of going to the court of Tsar Alexander II, Clay is going to offer his services to the War Department and organized around 300 men for his battalion. Other homegrown defenders included the Fossil Guards, which were 51 members strong, and they were all over 40 years old, (laughs) and a small band of the War of 1812 veterans calling themselves the Silver Grays. Okay. (laughs) The Silver Grays. Though I like the Fossil Guards, though, too. Yeah, I mean, that sounds old. I was going to (laughs) say, what are they, the people that, uh, they were the security at uh, retirement villages? Right, exactly. (laughs) Now, I know some of your Pennsylvania listeners, since we are right here in Gettysburg, are chomping at the bit to hear this. And of course, Pennsylvania has the honor of sending the first troops to Washington from outside the district. They would be known as the first defenders and arrived on April 18th. While the next day, the unfortunate 6th Massachusetts Infantry... Massachusetts infantry, excuse me, was jumped in Baltimore by secessionist elements of the population, setting off what we know as the Pratt Street riots, which would see the death of at least four soldiers and a dozen civilians. Mm. And some estimates are quite a bit higher than that, with dozens wounded on both sides. Now, regiments at this point are going to begin pouring into Washington, D.C. from across the north. The national capital is not the fortress city that it becomes. Mm -hmm. By 1864, by the end of the American Civil War, it's the most heavily fortified city on earth. It's not that at this point. And they need these troops. Now... Even though he's going to get there a little later than all these initial ones, I think uh, this quote from Elijah Hunt Rhodes really sums up the city and the um, appearance of the city that a lot of these guys are getting for the first time. Okay. Hurrah, we are in Washington, and what a city. Mud, pigs, Negroes, palaces, and shanties everywhere. <laughs> Sounds just, like a great city. Yeah, they're just trying to put people and these soldiers that are pouring in anywhere. Yeah, We have many accounts of soldiers being bunked, not only in the East Room of the White House, but within the Capitol building, which is still being built at that time, right. within the... Um, Patton Office Building, which is the National Portrait Gallery today, all of these beautiful stone right. uh, structures that are for the powers of government are being utilized essentially as barracks. Now, patriotism, peer pressure, boredom, and a sense of adventure, and even capitalism had sent the vast array of men from all levels of the socioeconomic ladder into the army. In addition, the ethnic diversity within the burgeoning Union Army at this time is extensive, with Germans and Irish making up the lion's share of foreign-born first and first-generation Americans, with significant contingents of English, Canadian, French, Italian, and American Indians in many other ranks, or many of their ranks, excuse me. Their experiences with the military and its structure was as varied as the men themselves, and we're going to get lots of accounts from the soldiers who are writing at this time about how the true Yankee is a very difficult soldier to mold, how we've all got, and I, and we see this in Southern armies too. There's this just streak of individualism in the American soldier that it's hard to mold into the larger constructs of the machine of war. Mm, okay. But these guys are going to be going through that and they're going to begin to drill. 
Now, the same day Pennsylvania's first defenders enter Washington, General Winfield Scott had offered been offered command of the army forming around the capital, or excuse me, I, I tripped over my own words there. He's going to offer command to Lee. Yeah. Okay. So that's the 18th of May, or April, excuse me. And Lee obviously declines, highly thought of by Scott, known as Old Fuss and Feathers. And this is what the colonel of the 1st United States Cavalry, Robert E. Lee, had wanted his whole life. Right. A command equivalent to what George Washington had. Mm-hmm. But he is going to decide to go south. He declines the offer and resigns from the United States Army on April 20th. Lee chose to remain with his home state of Virginia and accepts his state's offer of command of all Virginia forces. Now, what's interesting to note is that the same day that Lee resigns, Winfield Scott refused to. He had received a delegation from Virginia on April 20th who offered him command of the Virginia militia, a mostly ceremonial role to further embarrass the federal government. Scott rejected the offer out of hand, stating, I have served my country under the flag of the Union for more than 50 years, and as long as God permits me to live, I will defend that flag with my sword, even if my own native state assails it. Mm. Good for him. Yeah. Yeah. I mean... A man of his word. A man of his word, a man of his oath. Um, Winfield Scott is oftentimes derided um, in Civil War histories because he's not a healthy man. No. He's been in the army over 50 years at this point. He is a very large, <laughs> very sick man. Um and I think we poke a little fun at him. Well, yeah. Um but he's true. Yes. Okay? And um, to use that he's true blue all Sure, the sure. Good that's good. True blue. I like that. Yeah. yeah. Now, by Thursday, April 25th, Washington was feeling far more confident about its situation. They don't feel like there's Confederates breathing down their necks. While the troops had been arriving for days, on April 25th, we have two of the finest militia regiments in the country arrive. The 7th New York State Militia, which is blue blood to extreme. Okay, mm-hmm. But this is not a band box regiment by any sort. These guys are known throughout the country for their sharpness of drill, for their military look and ability to march and things of that nature. Um, and really, the Lincoln administration has been looking for them for quite some time. And so to have the 7th New York State Militia show up, it's a big deal. Yeah, I mean, okay. the, the, it just ripples through the streets of Washington that the 7th is here, we're safe, that sort of thing. So their reputation preceded Precedes them. them yes, exactly. Yes. Um, not only is the 7th New York there uh, or in, coming in, but we're also going to have the arrival of the 8th Massachusetts, another uh, regiment. And actually, the 7th New York and the 8th Mass uh, get along swimmingly. Those two regiments work together. Good for them. Um, They're going to arrive on April 26th, and the clustered commands around the Capitol begin to take on the veneer of professionalism. For many citizens, the immediate danger to Washington had passed. James Lane's frontier guards were disbanded on April 27th, and Lane himself declared, the point of danger is past. Secession may howl, but the Union is safe. (laughs) It's a bold claim. That is a bold claim. But How quick they were to declare the war over before it began. <laughs> right. Now, this is going to, with all of these troops now flooding into Washington, we got to build an army. Right. Okay. Yes. Lee, Lee has already said that he's not going to command said army. Winfield Scott is not in the physical capability to command said army in the field, so we got to find somebody. Mm-hmm. And this is going to lead to the building of the first army. Okay. The proto Army of the Potomac, if you will. Now, General Scott had recommended the commander of the Department of Washington as the commander of the troops in the field. Okay. Colonel Joseph K. Mansfield. Okay. Okay. Myself uh, and those of you who know the Maryland campaign, Mansfield plays a, a role. He's the commander of the 12th Corps at Antietam. Um, he is a. He is a lifelong military man. 
Mm-hmm. Okay. Okay. He doesn't have a lot of experience, like most officers at the time, commanding a lot of troops. Right, right. But he has been in the military his entire life. He is well received and well respected by the upper echelons of the military service in the United States, and Scott wants him to command. What does Lincoln think of him? Not a fan. Too old. <laughs> too old. He thinks he's too old. And oh, he is. He's okay. an older guy. All right. Um, he's 57. So instead, upon the advice of Secretary of War Simon Cameron, along with the Secretary of the Treasury, uh, Selman P. Chase, and the Ohio Governor William Dennison, Lincoln chooses Major Irvin McDowell hmm. and promotes him to a Brigadier General on May 14th. Now, why McDowell? What was the attraction to McDowell? He's got patronage. Ah, he's got big names within the cabinet okay. pushing for him. Uh-huh. And one of these, again, remember Ohio, Pennsylvania, New York are going to put more troops into the Union Army than anyone. Right. right. Um, and one of these big state governors is really pushing him. Okay. okay. Got it. So he's got the patronage vote, and that's what's going to get him the job. <clears throat> so May 14th, Brigadier General Irvin McDowell. Now, 10 days after McDowell's promotion, the federal regiments move across the Potomac into Virginia, seizing Alexandria. Okay, the first advance. Um, They're also going to seize the Arlington Heights. This secured a foothold for the Union in Virginia, as well as producing the first martyr of the war for the Union. Ah, yes. Colonel Elmer Ellsworth of the 11th New York Infantry, the Fire Zouaves, is killed at the Marshall Hotel there in Alexandria. Mm -hmm. As he's Mm -hmm. tearing down the secessionist banner on the roof, I believe the the hotel owner's name was Jackson, uh, point blanks him with a shotgun. He killed Mm -hmm. him instantly. Violating the man's free speech. Yeah, there you go. (laughs) Now, with both sides of the Potomac in federal hands, the region immediately around Washington became the Department of Northeastern Virginia on May 27th, with McDowell commanding all forces in the department from the Lee Mansion on Arlington Heights. Oh, so wait, so it's the Department of what? The Department of Northeastern Virginia. Okay, so that's the department. What is the name of the army at that point? <laughs> that's a great question, Matt, because <laughs> one of these great misnomers that we have about, say, First Bull Run is that the armies are switched, right? Mm-hmm. Okay. Yes. So, right. Um, but it's not exactly true. Um, are you familiar with the the blog, the excellent research blog, um, Bull Runnings? Yes. Yeah, I Harry am. Smeltzer. Mm-hmm. Okay. Fantastic historian and researcher. I love the name of that. Mm-hmm. Old Runnings. Exactly. I do too. Uh, I had the pleasure of listening to a a talk that he gave about First Bull Run and the plan for First Bull Run. And he was pretty quick to point out that there's this this idea that the Army's names were switched. And isn't that an interesting little fun fact? But there's actually no name for the Army of the Department of Northeastern Virginia. Okay. It's a department. Uh-huh. Okay. There is no official army name. I think So it's the Army of the Department of Northeastern Virginia. <laughs> right. <laughs> and and to be fair, there has been many, 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 many historians who have referred to it as the Army of Northeastern Virginia. Yeah. Okay. Um, but in the official records of the War of the Rebellion, it's referred to that once and it's like a year after First Bull Run happened. Okay. It's like as those reports are finally coming in. Mm, all right. Yeah. So now but so what I always heard was that uh, the Union Army was called the Army of Northern Virginia, right? And the Confederate Army was called the Army of the Potomac, right? Now that's true. Aha! Uh-huh. Beauregard's Army at First Bull Run is the Army of the Potomac, all right. And then Johnson has um, his own forces, Army of Shenandoah of the Shenandoah, I believe it is. I think that um, sounds familiar. They're going to get together and spoilers, they beat McDowell. <laughs> We're going to touch on that briefly. Um, that's one of the things that I also want to keep in mind for these discussions. We're not going to go super in-depth on no. each of the battles no, fought no. by we the We don't army. have the time. We're talking we about a, a year in an army's life. You right. can't go into the battles. Right. Not in not in any real depth, no. uh, unfortunately. You'll have to listen to Addressing Bull Run for that. <laughs> there you go. You're going to do a, a satellite? I'm, I'm looking for someone who's interested in Bull Run to do a, a franchise. Yeah, but I'm going to franchise the Addressing uh, thing. Yeah. No, <laughs> nice. I, I'm not joking. I'm, just you should talk to Harry. I got a Winchester guy. Where? Uh, oh yeah. Yeah yeah. Nice. No oh, yeah. I like that idea. He loves his uh, Winchester history and uh, all three so. fights there. J- not only not only the Civil War stuff. Oh. See, when you're addressing something, it doesn't you have, have to, to be anything. It all. Yes. Nice. That's, well, that's the whole <laughs> idea of the name. <laughs> I like it. Yeah. 
I like it. Now, with McDowell now kind of commanding this department, he's going to begin to brigade his forces. And so they're uh, once again taking on this veneer of an actual army. Right. And something that could be potentially controlled in the field. And that's good because as Union forces are gathering in the spring and early summer of 61, the home front begins to get anxious. Mm -hmm. and calls for on to Richmond and Mm. the rebel Congress must not be allowed to convene, begin to be seen in the newspapers. Mm -hmm. Uh, Particularly, this is coming from such influential papers as Horace Greeley's New York Tribune. Uh, He's really calling for an advance before the Confederate Congress can have their first big meeting in Richmond. Yeah, it's a good idea, right? Beat them before they get to form a government. Yeah, sure. Absolutely. Sure. Absolutely. There's nothing wrong with the mindset. It's just what sort of pressure are we putting on? Well, (laughs) you don't have an army ready to do it. All right. Um, As we we'll find out. By late June, the pressure to move was coming from the White House as well, because all of this pressure is coming on the Lincoln administration. So now they're kind of like, okay, we need to do something. Um, And so we would have... Confederate forces known to be in the vicinity of Manassas Junction, setting a line of defense along Bull Run. When discussing the situation on June 29th, McDowell and Scott are going to urge that more time is needed to prepare, but President Lincoln would famously respond, you are green, it is true, but they are green also. You are all green alike. Mm. Sage words, but it's going gonna, it's gonna to bite him in the rear. You, you, you're all green, but somebody's going to come out the victor. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. Now, McDowell's Department of Northeastern Virginia consisted of five divisions. The first division, under Brigadier General Daniel Tyler, has four brigades. Colonel David Hunter, another guy mm-hmm. who's going to make some fame in the Civil War or infamy, uh, commanded the second division, two brigades. The third division was commanded by Colonel... Samuel P. Heitzelman, who has three brigades, and the 5th Division was under Colonel Dixon Miles, which consisted of two brigades. Now, that's one, two, three, four, and one, two, three, and five. The 4th Division is a guy who I have very little experience with in the American Civil War, Brigadier General Theodore Runyon. Oh, Runyon. I remember that from the Take Command video game, Runyon's name. And oh, there like, you go. I don't remember if I've heard it much after that, right? Right. Did he, he die re- there? He remains in the Army. Oh, he does? Yeah. And his 4th Division is actually the Reserve Division uh-huh. for the department. Um, but I thought you'd get a kick out of what it's made of. Um, it's a curious mix of seven New Jersey regiments huh. uh, with one New York regiment. <laughs> and they're unbrigaded, so that's just this just mass all these of regiments? eight regiments. Oh. Yeah. It's like the... That's weird. It's the 1st, 2nd, 3rd, 4th... New Jersey State Militia and the 1st, 2nd, and 3rd New Jersey Infantry, and then this one random New York regiment. Huh. <laughs> that is that is weird. Yeah. Okay, so, see, but that's like, that's what's so interesting about it. When you look at the beginning of the war, and you look at how the armies were organized, it was, well, it seems, especially when you're used to like the Gettysburg uh, and beyond organization mm-hmm. of the army, um, it seems so hodgepodge and like half-assed. Yes. Yep. Not very organized. Right. Because the cavalry, like cavalry, for example, it's there was no cavalry the corps. Yeah. yeah. Right? In the, in the army, the, or the federal army at that point. Right. No corps of cavalry. It's just small units scattered. They're not even oh, it's brigaded. it's not even brigaded. Yeah. yeah. It's, they're barely regiments. Right. Because their regiments keep being broken up by company to do all the scouting and right. things like that and vignettes and whatnot. Um, it's about 35,000 troops, all told. Okay. okay. Not a huge army, but certainly the largest we've seen pretty much ever up right. to this point. Right. Um, now, they're going to step off around 2 p.m. on July 16th. McDowell proposed an advance on Manassas Junction to take control of the converging railroads, thereby taking control of Northern Virginia. He's not looking to crush the Confederates right. and... and uh, just destroy them and set the land to fire and all that. He's looking to take over territory, right. okay? yeah. take control of it. Deprive them of all the things that make that territory worth having. Right, yeah. exactly. Uh, to do this, he intends to move against the Confederate right, to turn the Confederate line, and force it to fight on ground of his choosing or flee. Okay, And we're going to see this a lot during the war. Everybody's trying to turn everybody else. Um Unfortunately, the condition of the ground did not warrant such an action, and so it was decided to turn the Confederate left instead. 
McDowell's plan got off to a rough start when his forces near the center of his column accidentally kicked off a fight at Blackburn's Ford Mm -hmm. on July 18th, 1861. Uh, This is an annoyance to McDowell, but likely just an embarrassment and does not really affect the larger campaign in and of itself. The turning of the left focuses on the Stone Bridge area. And, of course, there's the famous um, from our from our guy who commands the artillery here under Longstreet at Gettysburg. E.P. Alexander? Exactly. Alexander's in the Signal Corps service there at First Bull Run. Oh, right. He gives the warning. Right. Yes. But is he giving a warning? That's the thing. If... Well, what does he say? Good. He to says, tell, tell look the to your left, you're, you are turned. Right. Okay, that's what he says. That's the famous remark. It's actually on a monument, if I'm not mistaken. Mm-hmm. Um, but if it's a turning movement, you want your opponent to see that. Because that's what you're you want him to, do. to react. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. That's exactly right, Matt. Uh, you want him to react. You want him to see this. So how much... Um, information is that really giving to the confederate forces because mcdowell is going hey i'm going against your left to unhinge your position (laughs) Um, (laughs) now i gotta blur that right sorry (laughs) it's not a flanking movement yeah okay and that's the big so describe the difference between a turning movement and a flanking movement exactly um and and again this is something i really have to tip my hat to uh harry for kind of laying this out there the first time I I really thought about this, but a flanking movement is being done specifically for an attack and it's generally being done in secrecy. Uh Okay. You are trying to want that element of surprise. Exactly. You're trying to get that element of surprise. Yeah. A turning movement again can go around the flank, but you want them to see it. You're forcing them to react to this movement. So they have to adjust their front. Right. Basically. Or withdraw entirely, oh, right, which is right. what McDowell was really hoping for. Okay. So how much does this this famous call by E.P. Alexander actually help? Debatable. Hmm. Because McDowell wants him to see it anyways. So as we know, uh, July 21st, 1861, McDowell met the forces of Beauregard and Johnson on the rolling hills near Manassas Junction. After some success in driving back several different Confederate brigades, federal forces take Matthews Hill McDowell's pumped. He's riding along his lines, waving his cap. Victory, victory, the day is ours. The problem is it wasn't. Um, We are going to have more Confederate reinforcements coming up. Many of those reinforcements are already there at Manassas Junction. They just need to be advanced to the field itself. A lull falls over the field around noon as both sides pull forward their reserves and additional forces. And around 1 p.m., the fighting begins for Henry hill Hmm. now this dissolves into a series of poorly supported and uncoordinated attacks by federal forces and by 4 p.m federal troops are pushed off the field and begin an orderly retreat okay okay and that's important to remember because so far what do we think of when we think of bull run Uh, i think of a route exactly yeah and 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 civilians mixed in with baggage trains and and frightened soldiers and it's crazy and that's exactly right but that doesn't happen until cub run Ah. initially things are pretty good even with the black horse cavalry famously attacking the rear of the the federal army um the United States Marine Corps, interestingly enough, is there, and the 69th New York Infantry and a number of other units form square and punch the Jackson in the friggin' face, or excuse me, uh, Stuart in the friggin' face, and that's really the end of this pursuit. Right. Um, the problem is, is the civilians that get mixed in with the retreating forces, and when one of those wagons gets overturned at Cub Run, it blocks the bridge, and people start to panic. Mm-hmm. Then it devolves into a rout right. very, very quickly. Yeah. Okay. And they're going to fall back to Washington. It had to be a sight, though. It absolutely. Right? Absolutely. And one of the points that I wanted to make on this is that we think about the civilians Mm. coming out to watch this and how ridiculous that is. They're having their picnics and whatnot. No one has seen anything like this since arguably the War of 1812. Right. And how many? It's supposed to be a one shot. Right. This is the big the, deal. Exactly. This the is the war is going to be it. decided here, one this, way or the other. It's the coupe de grass. Exactly. Um, and so I don't blame <laughs> folks for wanting to 
to see this. And where they were, they couldn't see crap anyway. Dude, I'll tell you, we had that tornado uh, a couple weeks ago. On uh, uh, July 2nd, we had a tornado here. Mm -hmm. We hit through here. I'm still pissed off that I fell asleep and missed it. During your tornado? <laughs> yeah, because I love violent summer storms. I Me think too. they're fascinating, right? And I just there's like an energy in the air that I just love, right? It's one of the things I miss from Michigan actually. Really? Yeah, we get these these big bastards if you excuse the language <laughs> rolling in off the great plains. They uh -huh. suck up all sorts of water from uh, Lake Michigan and they just Pound Michigan. Yeah. They're some of the most impressive electrical storms I've ever seen. Oh, they're great. I love them. And uh, I, 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 we, I was out in the sun all day long, and I thought, well, I'm going to go and take a cold shower just mm -hmm. to cool, because I was hot to the core. So sure. I'm like, I got to cool down. So I went home to do that, and there I was going to go to the first Minnesota's uh, Liberty Rifles first Minnesota charge. Um, then I had like an hour and change, mm. so I'm like, okay, I can take a cold shower, I can lay in the air conditioner for a little bit. It, they're going to march to the spot. I've seen people march. I don't really need to see that. <laughs> uh, there's going to be a ranger who's going to talk for 20 minutes or something before that. You've heard I, rangers I've heard talk. rangers talk. I, don't, I just want to see them in the field and running. So I've got more than enough time. Two hours later, I woke up, missed the whole damn thing, and I missed the damn tornado. <laughs> so, And I was so pissed about missing the tornado. Sure. Because how often do you get to see that? And it did some damage on the south. I live on the north end of town. Mm -hmm. We just had rain. Mm -hmm. Barely any wind. I would have heard it. I was sleeping right by the window. Right. You know, south end of town was all torn to bits. Right. Not, not a town, but so south of town, I should say. Battlefield trees down everywhere. My friend's farm, trees down everywhere. Some people lost, like, roofs mm -hmm. and, and mm -hmm. small buildings. Like, it was crazy. Yeah, so tornado I understand. tornadoes are not a laughing matter. They, they, they kill people. Oh, yeah. Um, I understand, though, the desire of those civilians to go out and see something that you've never seen before. Right. We laugh at them today because we know better, because we know how the story ends. I guarantee if something like that were to happen again here, there'd be plenty of idiots with their stupid cell phones out wanting to get this stuff while there's literally like a battle and bullets flying, everything going in front of them. Mm -hmm. They're going to sit there with their cell phones. Well, look at the look at wannabe storm chasers. It's the same yeah, idea. Yeah. Um, or, or folks that just are war junkies and they're, and they're getting all these YouTube videos and things of the various yep. conflicts we have today. It's, it's a very similar idea. Or you see like three people beating one guy up in the middle of the street and everybody standing around is like, they've got their phones and like the person of the video who, who's nobody's calling 911. Nobody's they're calling 911. Yeah. They're on their phone. Yeah. And the person who's got the, the video that you're watching, you know, the camera, you just hear her voice in the back. Goes, oh, somebody should do something. Somebody should do something. It's like. Why don't you do something? Right. Don't get my video. I'm live streaming. Right. <laughs> Getting those likes. Yeah. But that's the same mentality. Well, and we see it throughout the war, too. We think, oh, sure. that's silly. We see it here? We absolutely see it mm -hmm. here. You see it in 64 at Monocacy. Um, Wallace is complaining about that. There's got to be stories at, at Sharpsburg like that, right? Eh, not, not really. As much. Yeah, most no, they're smarter there. <laughs> well, most everybody's hiding uh -huh. uh, in the cellars, or they've evacuated. Okay. Most of the town of Sharpsburg actually evacuates. So they're gone right. by the time the battle starts. Uh, but we don't... Actually, that's a super good question. There's a new book coming out on civilian stories. There's really only been the one for years, uh, but there's a new book coming out on civilian stories from Savas Beatty called when, uh, when Hell Came to Sharpsburg. I'm curious as to what they've dug up. Maybe we do have some. Yeah, maybe you're going to have new ones to tell in your tours. Yeah. yeah. Okay, but, so go ahead. Sorry. So let's get past Manassas. Exactly. I don't mean to uh, get off too far off track. But basically, this is a friggin' disaster, okay? <laughs> and yeah. the, the federal government needs to do something immediately. And so on July 22nd, a telegram is sent to the headquarters of the Department of the Ohio requesting their commander, Major General George B. McClellan, come to Washington as soon as possible. Uh -oh. That telegram had the dramatic impact on the lives of three different commanders, Irvin McDowell. It marked the loss of confidence in him by the administration. For McClellan, it would elevate him to the head of the force he is best remembered for, the soon-to-be-named Army of the Potomac. Mm -hmm. And, of course, for William S. Rosecrans, it would place him in command of the Department mm. and Army of mm. the Ohio, mm. what he's mm. best remembered for. Sure. 
Now, it's, it's, it's funny, though, how quickly they lose faith. Uh, and this McDowell's not the only one, but right. it seems pretty quick, though. One battle after that pep talk Lincoln gives them. Right. Yeah, you're green, but they're green, too. Everybody's green. Green every round. It's a green society. <laughs> Go get them. Yeah. <laughs> and then it's like, oh, you, you screwed up. Next. What's kind of funny about that is, is that there's this story that Winfield Scott was actually bemoaning the situation after first bull run and how he had gotten pressured into advancing with this green force and Lincoln's kind of like pretty sure I told you to do that (laughs) (laughs) and Scott's like whoa whoa wait let's uh let's backpedal here a little bit (laughs) but Let's talk a little bit about George McClellan. Sure. Okay? And I know a lot of your audience yeah. is just like, boo. Oh, I'm like, boo. <laughs> now, but we're going to have to talk about McClellan g- for a while uh, in these shows. You so, are. Yeah. So You're let's get used to him. <laughs> <laughs> I hate this guy. I hate him more than I hate Channing Barlow. Oh, okay. Wow. I, only hate, I only hate Barlow for his middle name. <laughs> okay. And that smug look he has in all of his pictures and in his statue. Yeah, well, McClellan's got some pretty <sighs> smug pictures, too. McClellan... Okay, so no. as for George Brinton McClellan, he's yes. born in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania on December 3rd, 1826. The son of prominent surgeon, his father is also the founder of Jefferson Medical College, so he's up Mo- there yeah, he's... when it comes to society. Mm-hmm. He attended preparatory school and the University of Pennsylvania before accepting an appointment to West Point in 1842 at the age of 16. Oh. Now, McClellan... That was, was an unusual, though, back then. It was not that unusual. He is a touch young, but it's not that unusual. Um, McClellan would be second in in his class of the famous class of 1846. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, Who was first? uh, As a gentleman, he I looked it up. He stays in the army and is uh, there. He's an engineer, but he never gets much higher than being the engineer of some of these forces. And I cannot recall his name off the top of my head. But he drove a train. Is basically what you're saying. Military engineer, oh, not, not, oh, oh. not railroad oh, okay. engineer. Okay, so he built like fortifications. There and you stuff. go. Okay. Yep. <laughs> um, let's see. West Point class of '46 is famous, famous, famous for its luminaries. We're going to have guys like John Gibbon, Thomas Jonathan Jackson, Ambrose Powell Hill, George Pickett, Jesse Reno, and George Stoneman, just to name a mm. few. There are 20 Civil War generals that come out of this class. Wow. Okay. North and South. He's going to be, George McClellan, is going to be a second lieutenant in the Mexican War. He's twice breveted for gallantry, just like Lee. And he would actually return to West Point after the war as an instructor. Now, he's going to go to Europe in 1855 as part of a three-man commission and remained there to observe the Crimean War, okay, 56 to 58. His experience there saw him recommend the 1857 gun howitzer the famous Napoleon that we see on every Civil War battlefield Mm -hmm. for production here in the United States, as well as the development of the McClellan saddle, which would remain the saddle for the United States military until mechanization. Wow. Yeah. That's with some variations, right? Like they modified it. Very slight variation. Have you ever ridden in a McClellan saddle? I have ridden. I have not ridden with a McClellan saddle. I um I did once. It was kind of comfortable. Was it? Yeah. I, some people how, I hear don't like it, but how does this? Because it's open in the middle of yeah. the seat. So how you get a little that, air. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, you do. You get some air there. You know, it's, okay. not, it's not all sweaty and right. everything. <laughs> Uh, but if it, you got you low hangers, then you got a place to put them. <laughs> <laughs> wow. I'm sorry, ladies and gentlemen. Um, but no, seriously though, what did you feel a a, a particular difference? I was. Young, I was in my late teens, early 20s, so I don't have much of a memory of what it felt like. I just remember it felt it felt different than a Western saddle. It mm-hmm. felt, to me, it felt more comfortable, um, but also at the same time, I kind of was like, I could see this getting uncomfortable after a while. But obviously, it must be a comfortable saddle if they kept it for... What to like World about War Two? Yeah, basically 100, about a hundred years yeah. almost. Yeah. yeah. So I mean, it had to be a good design for many reasons. It's based off a Hungarian design, and it's an excellent design. Yeah. yeah. It's it's apparently much easier on the horse than a full Western saddle is. Right. Right. And and that I think is more important. It's not so much about the ass of the rider; it's more about the back of the, the back horse. of the horse. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. 
Now, he's going to return. George McClellan returns to the United States from the Crimea in 1857 and resigns his commission. Uh, He becomes the chief engineer of the Illinois Central Railroad, and he would marry Mary Ellen Marcy in 1860. Okay. Okay. Who does he beat for her hand? Oh, wait. Oh, I used to know this. You know Um, it. Shoot, it's not coming to my... Hold on. Give me a second. Corps, Army, Northern Virginia. Daniel Sickles. No, no, oh, oh, no, I'm sorry. Army, Northern Army, Virginia. Northern Virginia. <laughs> AP Hill. Correct. Ambrose Powell Hill. Uh, they had both uh, gone after uh, Mary Ellen Marcy. Her father, Randolph Marcy, a very well-known officer in the United States Army, he did not want his daughter marrying into the Army life. I suspect that's one of the reasons why McClellan's like, uh, okay, I'm out. <laughs> <laughs> and, wow. uh, and also, he really he's going to make her. a lot more money sure. in civilian life. Uh, by 1860, of course, uh, he's now married to Mary Ellen, and he is the president of the Ohio and Mississippi, Mississippi Railroad when the war broke out. Mm. Okay, So he's doing very well for himself financially and professionally. At the beginning of the war, at least three states are going to contact him, requesting him to command their state forces. Okay. So Ohio... Pennsylvania and New York, the big three. And I've heard rumors that there was at least two other states that also wanted McClellan. Ohio's letter is going to arrive first. There's a lot of speculation that had the Pennsylvania letter not been misdirected, he probably would have taken Pennsylvania's forces. But Ohio's letter arrives first, and he would uh, claim that and becomes a major general of Ohio state volunteers. Okay. Now, at the urging of the Secretary of the Treasury, uh, again, Salmon Chase, McClellan was advanced to Major General in the regular Army on May 14th. His efforts as commander of the Department of the Ohio saw a series of minor victories in western Virginia that July that secured the vital Baltimore and Ohio Railroad. He would be lauded in the press as the Napoleon of the present war, or as we, of course, would know him, the Little Napoleon Mm -hmm. or Little Mac. Little Mac. Uh, McClellan arrived in Washington on July 26th and met with General Scott the following day, the 27th. He would meet with President Lincoln and assumed command of the military division of the Potomac, which was made up of both the Department of Washington and Northeastern Virginia. Okay. Okay. So Northeastern Virginia Department is still being commanded nominally by McDowell, and Department of Washington is being commanded by Mansfield, and they're now both under McClellan. Under McClellan. Um, One of the more famous quotes from this time coming out of this is from McClellan himself to Mary Ellen, who he wrote uh, habitually. These two are very much in love. Say Mm -hmm. what you will about George McClellan. He very much loved his wife, and she very much him. Did he have a pet name for her? Uh, Actually, that's a great question. I've read a lot of their letters, and I don't see a pet name. Okay, okay. And he would write to her, I find myself in a new and strange position, President, Cabinet, General Scott, and all referring to me. By some strange operation of magic, I seem to have become the power, emphasis is his, in the land. I almost think that there were, that were I to win some small success now, I could become dictator or anything else that might please me. But nothing of that kind would please me. Therefore, I won't be dictator. Admirable (laughs) self-denial. I see already the main causes of our present failure, and I am sure, again, emphasis his, I can remedy these and am confident that I can lead these armies of men to victory once more. Mm. So he's had some success in Western Virginia. He's extremely confident in himself, and he's going to begin to build the Army of the Potomac. Now, in matters of strategy, McClellan and Scott are going to clash. Scott advocated for what we now know as the Anaconda Plan, Mm -hmm. the slow crushing of southern coastal and inner waterway resources to cripple southern economy and force them to the negotiating table. McClellan felt that the defeat at Bull Run had ended the potential for negotiation and advocated advances south across the board. He wants to see the main focus in Virginia, but he wants to see people moving in Ohio and further west. Now, he proposed on the Virginia front to have an army of 273,000 with 600 cannon backing it up. Wow. That he would personally lead south. Holy shit. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) That is the correct answer. Yeah. Wow. (laughs) Um, While their strategies differ, 
differed, excuse me, the pressure for an immediate advance on Richmond had relaxed and both generals agreed that a rigorous period of training for officers and men was needed. As such, drill was implemented for all regiments already in Washington, while those that had continued to arrive throughout the summer were assigned to a dedicated provisional division under the command of Brigadier General Silas Casey. So one of the guys who writes the manual, Mm -hmm. he's commanding these new troops to Mm -hmm. put them through their rigors and their basics. Makes sense. Yes. Now, he's going to begin their education in the school of the soldier, drilling in the squad, the platoon, the company, and the regiment was implemented as well as skirmish drill and bayonet drill, and even some target practice. Not a ton of target practice, but some. Okay, uh, McClellan is also going to do a good job cleaning up Washington. He is going to assign regular Army troops as the Provost Guard. Again, Provost, Prevost, but Provost Guard. <laughs> Provo. <laughs> Provo. Uh, and basically is keeping the soldiers out of the saloons, out of the bars, and they're checking passes, should you even be in the city, that mm, sort of thing. Mm-hmm. And this is not just the enlisted men. They're cracking down on officers. Yeah. He's whipping it into shape. Right. Exactly. Now, the differences in command between Scott and McClellan soon began to strain their relationship. Scott was particularly annoyed that McClellan felt that the Capitol was imminent, was in imminent danger, while McClellan thought Scott did not appreciate the seriousness of the situation. Both men put in the work, though. Okay. Uh-huh. But McClellan was physically in the field. He is going to, he has a prodigious ability to work at this time. And it is honestly extremely impressive. We're talking 12, 14, sometimes 16 hour days. Oftentimes the majority of those days are in the saddle as he's riding the lines, checking on everybody. Sure. He's going out to picket posts and checking on the men. Well, Um, I mean, to hear him describe how he finds himself in that situation, if I had all those people plucking me out of basically like relative obscurity at least Mm. um you'd be busting your butt too i'd be yeah i'd be pretty plucky you know (laughs) i'd be like wow you know but like uh talk to me a year later right it's a different story but at first i would i would be uh, there'd be a spring in my step sure absolutely and he is doing that he's observing the training he's observing the logistics and making sure uh, the men get what they need he's conferring with politicians which he hates doing as most officers seem to Uh, and he's building a relationship with the men Mm. okay while this relationship met with early challenges in the case of the mutiny of the second Maine and the 79th new york infantries for the most part mcclellan took on a very paternal approach towards the army and the men in it now how old is he at this point 34 34 yep young man Mm -hmm. young man taking on a paternal uh role yep i mean his first daughter is about to be born she's going to be born in a about a month, but he is definitely... But he's not actually a father yet. Not quite. In real life. Right. But he's able to uh, do that. Yeah, some people just have that knack. Right. You know. Exactly. But 34, you know, today that sounds so young, but that wasn't that young back then. No. I mean, he's he's a man well into his life and well into his career at this yeah. point. I'm yeah. not saying he's going to die at 40. No. Um, we, have, we have this sometimes, oh, they died so young back then. Uh, well, did they? No, no. Not really. No. Um, but did you notice one of those two regiments I called out for? Having- Second Maine. Yeah. And, and I was going to ask you that. Um, what mutiny are you talking about there? <laughs> it, it sounds like they're uh, the best thing that they do is mutiny. <laughs> uh, they fought very well at first bull run, uh-huh. okay, and they got shot up for it. Um, but in August of '61, a bunch of the three month guys go home, and 66 men from the Second Maine say we want to go home too. <laughs> <laughs> so this is this is not a new thing when they are not coming to Gettysburg. Thing. Right. It sounds like people in Maine don't know how to read contracts. Uh oh. <laughs> <laughs> you I mean, just no, lost your Maine listeners. <laughs> no offense to the five people in Maine who listen to us, but <laughs> but like what wait, hey, he's what, talking about me. <laughs> <laughs> but this happens early on, and you think they would have learned that. It, again, in 1863, mm-hmm. same thing, basically. What's interesting about this mutiny is, again, it's only 66 guys. Right. Um, most of them are sentenced to hard labor at Dry Tortugas, Fort okay. Jefferson, but most of them actually don't even make it down there. They're actually sent to the second New York, and they serve with them for a while. Oh. Um, the other unit that's talked about, it's a pretty famous one, 79th New York, Cayman's Highlanders. Sure. McClellan takes their colors. Really? Yep. Why? 
because they uh, are they're mutiny and they want to go home oh, and stuff like that. And he's yes. like, ah, eh, yoink. And he's going to take their colors away. That's a huge blow to the honor of the regiment. It's sure, sure. And so they stay. They stay. They've got to earn those colors back. They're going to. Don't get me wrong. It's a fine regiment. Um, I, I just, I'm picturing people today. Go ahead, take my effing flag. I want to go <laughs> I'm home. I'm going home. Yeah, yeah. Like you know, it's it's a it's a it's a flag. Right. But it was a different time. Different time. People were different, different. mindset. Yeah. And it's the men around you too. Well, well, yeah. You it's might that, it's you that. might have the mindset of a. It's an effing flag. I want to go home. No, I don't if, have that mindset. Right. You obviously. Obviously. Not. <laughs> but if the color guards there. They just had their honor removed from them right. by the commanding general, no right, less. Right, 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 okay. right, right, right. So they're going to stick around. Okay. Okay, good for them. Now, on August 20th, 1861, McClellan's Department of the Potomac was expanded, and the Army of the Potomac is christened. Uh-huh. So now they are officially the Army of the Potomac. This is from General Orders Number 1 from the Army of the Potomac. I hereby assume command of the Army of the Potomac, comprising the troops serving in the former departments of Washington and northeastern Virginia in the Valley of the Shenandoah and the states of Maryland and Delaware. You're all under George McClellan now, and nominally all in the Army of the Potomac. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Now, did they... Uh, I mean, I would imagine this is written somewhere that uh, it's not a coincidence that the northern armies were named after rivers. Correct. It was on purpose. Somebody said, why do we name our armies after the nearest rivers they're operating in or something mm-hmm. like that, right? Right. So the Army of the Potomac, and Ohio. And I have not seen that discussion. Like, is it the War Department right, laying that's my this question. down? Yeah. Is it the the commanders in the field going, and which, according to this map, which, which river are we near? Guess we'll call ourselves that one. <laughs> right. Um, but you're right. They, yeah. they do tend to be named after waterways. So that's not just by happenstance. Like, yeah. that was actually a by design. They were going to do that. I have to believe it, since pretty much all federal armies are. I mean, there's a handful that aren't. But and then the Confederate smarter. armies are named after states. Or regions. Or, right. And so did they, did they like, flag a truce, and then, you know, guys come and like, all right, listen, we're going to name our... Um, armies after states or regions you guys do rivers <laughs> i highly doubt there no. was that formal so of it discussion. just worked out that way yeah especially if Beauregard had remained in command uh, i think he might have had a little umbrage with the federals referring to themselves as army of the potomac <laughs> <laughs> do you mean pierre gustave Toutant Beauregard? <laughs> Beauregard yes exactly Toutant. Toutant. all right so okay so now august 20th they're officially the army of the potomac officially the army of the potomac good exactly uh, now they're going to start kicking ass right well that's the hope but uh, <laughs> not quite yet <laughs> now by september mcclellan was no longer as concerned about a confederate lunge towards washington okay. and had begun to push his forces into northern virginia beyond the defensive zone of alexandria Okay, we've already had this toehold, toe, toe toehold hold, excuse me, for a little while now, uh, but now we're going to push beyond that. A sharp skirmish near Lewinsville, Virginia, on September 11th, was fought so well that McClellan would actually return the colors of the 79th New York Infantry in gratitude for their actions there. So they had lost their colors; now they got them back. Yeah, good for them. <laughs> good for them, exactly. Um, this was not the end of the extensive training regiments, however. Regiments, however, on September 27th, McClellan wrote Rhode Island Governor William Sprague, I only ask for the delay to make a real army, that the public opinion shall not urge us to premature action. And that's really the overwhelming concern yeah. that McClellan has. And Winfield Scott, to his credit, has this concern as well. He'd had it before First Bull Run. He still has it during this period. But McClellan really wants to see his force trained up properly. And I understand that. I I don't blame him for that. Right. I would want that too if I were in his shoes. Now, there were some irritations in civilian quarters about the apparent lack of movement by the now-named Army of the Potomac, but nobody wanted a repeat of Bull Run. As such, the training and reconnaissance continued. In the federal high command, however, a fight was brewing as General Scott demanded that reports and information flow through the proper chain of command. All the while, it was apparent that McClellan was circumventing the chain and reporting directly to President Lincoln Mm -hmm. and his cabinet. 
Scott would be hurt by this. He's also tired. He's sick and now angry. Um, and he's going to put in another request to resign. He'd already done it a couple of times, but basically it was the whole, you got to be kidding me, there's a war on. Right, right. <laughs> um, but he puts in a request again to resign. Uh, it's discussed and approved by the cabinet of the Lincoln administration on October 18th. And on October 31st, 1861, the old soldier, old fuss and feathers himself, will board a train in Washington, D.C. and begin to head north. Mm. He's going to go to West Point, And that's kind of where he's going to live out his career. Um, it's kind of sad, honestly. Sure. Nobody's there to see him off. From oh, the, really? From the Lincoln administration. Was he a Democrat? I believe he was. Oh, there you uh, go. There's your reason. <laughs> well, I, I hope it's not that, but George McClellan's there. Yeah. Well, he was a Democrat. He is, but he's also <laughs> the guy he's been, been, yeah, been yeah. clashing with Scott. But, but you know, McClellan, oftentimes people who clash respect each other better right. than anybody else. That's true. And, and McClellan does write, again to Mary Ellen, about how it was sad to see the old soldier, as he, recall, as he calls him, um, leaving in this way, sick and, and broken and whatnot. Um, but there, there is a respect there still. Mm, and in, yeah. fact, in fact, Scott still respects McClellan. He just doesn't like him. Right. Of course. Of course. <laughs> and he says so as in, in direct conversation, apparently. He actually said that to him. Right. Um, but that would be the end of Winfield Scott, at least directly in this story. Um, prior to him leaving, though, we would have one more tragedy for the developing uh, army, um, Battle Balls Bluff. Oh, yeah. Fought on October 21st, 1861. Uh, it is another federal debacle on the banks of the Potomac River. The uh, Stones Division had advanced thinking that they were going to get the jump on a Confederate camp. Come to find out it was not a camp. It was actually misidentified, probably a fence. It's been speculated that it was probably a white picket fence that had looked like white tents, tents in yeah. the distance. Um, and confederate forces are suddenly going to realize hey there's a whole bunch of federals on our side of the river get them and that's because <laughs> they've they got did. high ground the confederates right well they've got high ground they're also able to converge their forces the, right. the problem is not so much the ground initially okay. it's just that there's a very isolated element of federal troops that have crossed the potomac river they have found not what they were anticipating and suddenly they're out on their own hook and crook mm -hmm. as confederate right. forces converge on them gotcha the ground thing occurs during the retreat because it's about 30 to 40 feet from where the majority of the battle occurs down to the banks of the potomac okay it's almost a straight drop got it got okay. it so they actually the union troops do get up onto the bluff yes okay yeah and they're and they push beyond and things of that nature got it um but that's a disaster Okay, and a number of dominoes are going to fall because of that. Um, first and foremost, on or excuse me, because of the death of Edward Baker uh, with the seventy first Pennsylvania Infantry, it's who's a very close personal friend of Abraham Lincoln and a senator. That is going to lead to the development of the Joint Committee on the Conduct of the War. Oh, yes, yes, okay. yes, 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 yes. Uh, that doesn't, it's not formed quite yet, but now Congress is thinking about it because one of their own just ate a bullet. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so, but a number of things are now going to fall very, very quickly, and this will be kind of how we wrap things up okay. for 1861. On November 1st, McClellan is made general in chief of all federal forces. Okay. And when Lincoln asks him, hey, you, you're going to be able to do this? Um, McClellan literally says, I can do it all. Oh, so mm, here you go. Famous last happens. words, Mac. Yep, exactly. So he's basic. So he's basically, uh, got, uh, what Grant's going to have the job that he's going to have. Yes. With. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Right. He now, is when McC general in chief when, okay. Later than he'll be replaced by Halleck Halleck. Yep. In 60, but Halleck stays in. Right. Okay. I get it. So. McClellan chooses to go in the field while he's general in chief of all the armies. Correct. Halleck stays in Washington. Correct. That's Grant also somewhat of a request by Lincoln. Okay. And then Grant says, no, I'm going to go with the Army of the Potomac. Correct. Okay. Got it. So McClellan's got the biggest of hats now um, and commands everything. We are going to have a grand review mm. on November 20th. This will be the largest concentration of United States forces ever up until this point okay at bailey's crossroads virginia 
Um, How seven, many? 75,000 men. Okay. Uh, it's the majority of the Army of the Potomac. Um, the Lincoln administration is out there. Abraham Lincoln himself is out there um, reviewing the troops. It's a grand pageantry. McClellan's in his element. Uh, the 49th Pennsylvania Infantry would actually get yelled at uh, during this event because they stop before the reviewing stand and begin to go through the manual of arms and show how good they are at drill. <laughs> and a young They're proud of themselves. Exactly. And a young Brigadier General Winfield Scott Hancock rides up and in strong language tells them to get their ass moving <laughs> because there's so many other troops that have right. to go by the stand. <laughs> It's awesome. Now, real quick, though, um, the Army of the Potomac is uh, formed and everything like that. Mm -hmm. The other armies, are they formed at the same time? Oh, that's a fine question. Um, the departments are forming okay. at this time, and the departments are going to um, form and divide and become different. Like, for instance, the Department of Ohio is pretty much the Army of the Ohio. Okay, right. Okay. Um, but we've got things further west that are, are not armies they're departments and then they have armies in them okay, okay? and we're going to see so that we'll, they'll, they'll evolve later yes. in the war okay exactly all right so go ahead i'm sorry so according to one of the officers that is there at bailey's crossroads and seen this grand pageantry of war in realization of all observers even the most experienced officer even to the most experienced officer the army was born that day because they're all there and everyone can see them. they can see each other yeah um, as we said, on December 9th, the Joint Committee of the Conduct of the War is formed due to the debacle at Ball's Bluff, and it would continue to play a role over the course of the Civil War. So you're going to hear about this again. Your listeners will hear about this again. And then to wrap things up, we have one more fight before winter quarters. Oh. The Battle of Drainsville. Drainsville. And Drainsville is important because our, our good friends in the PA Reserves <laughs> kick some butt. Too bad Eric's not here. Right, exactly. I, I, I wanted to include that for yeah. Eric, but McCall he's got the Rona. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. Yeah. I've I've had the Rona myself. It I've sucks. I've had it twice in the last year. Oh, but um, um, McCall's division, the Pennsylvania Reserves, go down. They've been in the vicinity of Drainsville for a while. They push out, um, and there's a Confederate force attempting to basically. Um, gather resources in the region okay. and they kicked the hell out of them uh reading the after action reports it doesn't sound that way especially if you read jeb stewart's uh it is the most puffed up overblown <laughs> after action report i have ever read um, stewart stewart no. no but it is definitely a federal win okay um, on the 21st of december we're going to have a review of um porter's command um, and of course, Porter being a, a, a friend of a very close friend of George McClellan, and it would be there that McClellan would um, begin be getting sick. And that's where we're going to leave things off because he is okay. going to be out of commission for the rest of 1861 and into the early months of 1862. Okay. Typhoid and some other illnesses that overtake him. So, so we're going to find out who uh, is in his stead uh, while he's sick uh, now, or are we going to find that out in the next episode? In the next episode. Oh, Matt, a cliffhanger. <laughs> that's right. Okay. Uh, and it's important to note <laughs> that during the grand review at Bailey's Crossroads, during the review of Porter's troops, um, Fitz John Porter, they're all divisions. We're not seeing Corey. Right. Okay. And that's an important thing to keep in mind as we move into 1862. But Matt, uh, this has been a, a really interesting bit of research to, to put together for you. I've enjoyed doing it. Um, well, even yeah. even when I was knocked out for a week by the Rona and fell behind schedule, uh, but there was no schedule, so it's it's fine. <laughs> oh, that's true. <laughs> but I've I've enjoyed doing it, and I look forward to coming back to to do this again for 1862, when of course a lot is really going to be happening. Yeah, I, I'm looking forward to that too. Can you do it tomorrow? <laughs> I <laughs> no, definitely cannot do it tomorrow. <laughs> I'm just teasing. Uh, we, and I know the audience likes when you're on the show, Matt. So uh, you've got three more of these, ladies and gentlemen. So you get to get Matt all throughout the year. Every time you get bored with what we've been putting out, we're going to spike your interest with uh, a Matt Borders episode. Uh, and, and I don't know if you guys know this, but Matt is a uh, licensed guide at Antietam. Mm -hmm. And last fall, we took a tour with him. 
and uh, it was really good. It was really cold and windy. Yes. Um, <laughs> but we went and warmed up with a nice hot meal afterwards. But uh, it is a really good tour. And if you are interested in ever going down to Antietam and you want uh, to get a tour with Matt, um, let me know. Matt at AddressingGettysburg.com. Or I guess they can maybe email you directly or do you not want to give that out? Do it at just Matt at AddressingGettysburg.com, and I'll put you in touch with Matt if you want there to you do go. a tour with Maddie uh, down there at Antietam. Matty B., thank you very much. You're very thank welcome. Thank you very Matt. much. It's I appreciate pleasure. it. Absolutely. A pleasure is all mine. And all of you guys out there listening and watching, thank you very much, and we will talk to you next time. Our hearts so stout have got a stain for suit is known from whence we came. Wherever we go, they dread the name of Gary Owen and glory. Instead, it's fall, drink down in the pain.